So hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Corp Fit podcast. I'm your host Esther, a corporate coach at Corp Fit, where we help individuals get fit for a corporate career. Today, we are joined by our panelists and we're going to be discussing how to break into the finance industry and get a career there. But before we get into that, firstly, I want to say a huge, huge, huge congratulations to a few of our members in the Corp Fit community who have secured roles recently, Johnson, George and Milo. So a big well done. We also have various roles in investment banking for you guys, so do get in touch. As I mentioned, today we'll be talking about securing a role in the finance and technology industries. And we are joined by an exceptional panel here. We have some of our corporate coaches, Solomon, Victor and Safiya here joined with us today. And we also have a very, very special guest, Reggie Nelson here. And we're going to pick his brains a little bit. So firstly, um, could I ask you, what you are doing currently work-wise, Reggie, and how you got into that. What route did you take? Yeah, sure. Uh, so currently I work at Blackstone, which is a private equity company and also does a lot of real estate for the most part. I uh, work in private wealth solutions. So my day-to-day role is to manage relationships for private banks that want to invest in our real estate funds or private equity funds or um, private credit funds. And how I got into this role in particular, so I was headhunted for this role, Mm -hmm. but how I got into the industry, I started my career on a graduate program at Legal in General, investment management, rotating across distributions and investments. Mm -hmm. And I went to university, so went through that route, did a handful of internships there, Mm -hmm. and then landed my graduate program. Okay, brilliant. And if I could ask the same question to our corporate coaches at CorpFit. So starting with you, Safiya. Um, Yep, so I'm Safiya. I'm a software developer degree apprentice at a bulge bracket investment bank. Um, How I got here was through sixth form. I was quite adamant that I wanted to do a degree apprenticeship. So I applied and did a lot of research and then landed my position now. Okay, congratulations. And what about you, Victor? Uh, Similar to Sophia, I'm a technology degree apprentice at a bulge bracket firm. I'm currently in the fixed income division, but working in an SRE role, which is software reliability engineering. Okay, and Solomon, last one. Hi everyone, least. my name is Solomon, also coined as the bodybuilding banker. I'm currently at a buyout fund. I've previously done a couple of years in MA and um, yeah, a bit different, enjoying the role, but yeah, glad to be here. Um, I hope it wasn't too hot getting here. Obviously, outside is really hot. So, I do have a few questions for all of you, starting off with Reggie. So, thank you for coming and letting us pick your brains today. Okay, so you have quite a crazy um, journey, a crazy story that I feel like a lot of people have seen on the news and elsewhere. So the first question I have for you is obviously, what gave you the idea? And I think I know, you know what I'm talking about, so you can explain. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, So the idea stemmed from, stemmed from two places, really. Um, Stemmed from a TV show that my sister and I was watching by uh, the late John Rivers, How'd You Get So Rich? And... I think it was it was very much faith led as well. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I did what I did was because I was at a crossroad and not really knowing what I wanted to do with my career long term. So I was playing football at the time, playing at a relatively high level. Uh was on a two year contract, but halfway through it I decided that I didn't want to play football anymore. Mm-hmm. And just thinking long term, I I suffered the death of my father at that time as well. So I wanted to do something that was gonna provide for myself and for my family. Mm-hmm. So then I wanted to find out how the wealthy amassed wealth. And I went to Kensington and Chelsea and started asking people what skills they had so that I could extrapolate that and use it for myself. But literally door to door. Yeah, no. So at first it was just asking people in the streets, mm-hmm. right? And um, asking like what skills they had. That wasn't like, no one was stopping to talk to me. Yeah. So then, um, that's when I decided to like up it up a notch and go and knock on people's doors. Because at this point I just wanted a response. Mm. And um yeah, knocked on a on a particular door. The door opened, and yeah, I, th- I think we're gonna, probably going to go into it a bit more. But that's yeah. how the idea came about. Okay, brilliant. So in twenty twenty two, obviously, it's a bit of a different time. Do you think a similar idea could work for someone that was in that is in the position you were in? And if not, what advice would you give for someone in this day and age? Um, would it work? I, honestly, the answer is I don't know. Um, my advice would be to just think innovatively. I think at that point, I wanted to find something that not many people would think of doing just so I could stand out and it could promo more questions from the people I was talking to because mm-hmm. I didn't have a network. I didn't have family and professional quote unquote careers. So I couldn't leverage the people around me. I couldn't tap into people to gain advice. So 
I want I was starting from the ground up and I needed to to build that. So I think anyone in my position at the time, I think that's where you start and you do what you do how that looks like to you. So if you have a network around you, then tap into that. If you have a particular person that could help you, then again, tap into that, a mentor, sponsors, whatever it might be. I think that's what I was trying to build out initially. And if you don't have that, then by all means, you have to think innovatively to get there. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, w it will work, but you have to almost tailor it to yourself and yeah. think innovatively outside the box so that you can gain as much interest as possible. Okay, yeah, I hear that. So kind of leaning on the resources you have around you, but above that thinking outside the box to kind of create something that's, you know, for you and tailored to you and works for you. Um, so you did mention that you ended up knocking on a particular door. So do you want to go into whose door that was and what, like how things changed for you at that moment? Yeah, sure. So I was in the area for about three hours knocking on people's doors, asking people the question about how they like what skills they had to to amass wealth. And um, I knocked on this particular door and a, a lady opens the door. Well, at first she's speaking to me through her intercom, so she can see me, but I can't see her. Mm -hmm. And she's asking me res respectfully, like, why am I here? Um, and I, I told her why I'm here. And then she, she comes to open the door and then invites me into her house. We start talking for about five minutes and then her husband walks in. So her husband was the head of Alpha Strategies at BlackRock, which is the largest asset, asset management company in the world. And he was equivalent to like, like a CIO equivalent, right? He was on a senior exec team globally and he was traveling, he was working across London and, and New York. And we started talking for about an hour and he said, have I ever considered a career in finance? And I was honest, I said no, because at that point I wasn't chasing anything to do with like, professional careers I just I didn't really know what I wanted to do at that point I just focused on football and school was never my thing anyway so I didn't really focus in school and didn't want to go to university or anything like that but he um posed a question to me around university around uh finance and asset management so then I went into BlackRock like a week later for an insight day insight day led to a work experience for a week and um that's when I had a meeting with him my mum and another guy called Abraxas and they encouraged me to go to university, which I didn't want to do, right? But he said, if I wanted to break into the sector, it's really competitive. You're going to be competing against some of the smartest candidates in, in the country. There's a finite number of positions. You have to you know, build yourself up and, and make yourself as competitive as possible. So that's when I, I went to university. And yeah, that's when the journey into like finance actually began. But before that, I didn't want to go into... Fine. I didn't even know about finance. Like my first day at BlackRock, I didn't even know how to to like dress the corporate attire. Do you know what I mean? Like the Nike yeah. side pouch and like my shirt was like really big. My tie was like up to here. Yeah. Like nothing was sort of, I didn't fit the norms of, a, of, of um, I didn't have the corporate fit. Yeah, yeah pun intended. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, that's, that's when the journey started. So university is when I started to pick it up and then, you know, it, it fell into place from there. Okay. So it's crazy to think how like advice from one, person can change your whole you know trajectory of like your career and what you're going to do because you didn't plan to go to university and you may not have not at all. gone if you hadn't knocked on that uh, one door university was steep as well i i failed my first exam like i i didn't know anything about like economics like i studied economics right mm -hmm. i didn't know economics had maths in it <laughs> I, I, I i kid you not i never studied maths yeah. like past gcse and i did that early like a year early so i hadn't touched maths since like year 10 mm -hmm. um didn't know anything around sort of finance and careers or spring internships or anything like that. Yeah. So I was starting from like a blank canvas, mm -hmm. right? My first day in a university was my first time ever stepping in a university. I didn't go to open yeah. days or anything like that. Or like nothing, you had nothing, no experience. Nothing at all, nothing at all. It was all very much last minute. Mm -hmm. So uh, my first exam, I scored like 25%, which is a fail. Yeah, um, a strong one. Yeah, yeah <laughs> tough fail, yeah, yeah, tough fail. Yeah. And I was, very close to leaving university like within the first sort of semester because I thought it was the first exam I failed it it's not going to work I'm going to sort of find something else to do yeah but um back to your point of one person being like the sounding board and the catalyst for all of this he was a person that encouraged me gave me sound advice next exam was I scored 82 percent and then 84 percent and then I was like you know I'm quite quite smart like yeah, I can maybe yeah do you know what I mean yeah. I can I can I can mm. do this and from there, the spring internships fell into place. I did one internship, another one led on. And you know, throughout university, I think I did like five internships at various asset managers and hedge funds in the city. 
um, and then graduated and started my career in finance. That's crazy. So you you went from getting 25% in an exam to eventually writing a book. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to tell yeah. us a bit about that book and what it's like to be published? Yeah. So the book, so my book is called Opening Doors. Okay. And it was published 12th of May this year, 2022. Um, I started writing in 2018. So talk about, yeah, talk about four years to, from very beginning to very end. The whole writing process itself took about six months. But from beginning of like sourcing the agent, getting all the deals in place, getting a book deal, negotiations, contracts, all that stuff, to the book actually coming out was about four years. And the reason why I wanted to write a book was... 2018 is when my story sort of broke and like the main media outlets found out about my story and stuff. And I think it did like eight out of 10 of the largest um, newspapers by circulation in the country. And it traveled to North America and other places in, on the continent. And I did like BBC, ITV and all these like major platforms and stuff, but I hadn't told a story from my own lens. And you know, I've given the these platforms the opportunity to tell my story, but I wanted to tell it from myself from very beginning to very end. Yeah. So I wanted to write a book to just document that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, four years on, the the book sort of came out. And even though the writing process itself was super nostalgic, it was quite emotional, mm -hmm. um, particularly the beginning half, because the beginning half is what I really wanted to echo on and, and hone in on. People knew about the latter end, about mm -hmm. working in finance, working with the prime minister, doing all of these different things that I did, but no one knew about the beginning. And I felt like the beginning shaped what was happening right now so um the writing process was was amazing um and yeah i, I just want to big up my agents for that because they um yeah. no they they really had confidence in me because again i've never like i've struggled quite a bit not so much now but in times past with like the imposter syndrome and mm. feeling like not belonging and all that stuff but i just I, i'm fortunate i've had good people in my corner to to back me and and help me sort of overcome those barriers and those hurdles so in finance, it was Quinton, it was Braxis, it was the people I've met along the way. In this new world of writing, my agents, like I wanted a ghostwriter mm -hmm. to write the book. But um, <laughs> nah, my agent said, write one or two chapters and we'll see. Yeah. So I wrote like one or two chapters and she just said, there's no way you're getting a ghostwriter. You're writing this yourself. Yeah. And that was a confidence I needed. So I went away, hid myself away for like six months, 50,000 words later, gave it to her and said, look, this is the first draft. And she was like, I can't believe you ever wanted a ghostwriter. This yeah. is insane. So, um, yeah, from there, we we sourced the book deal, had three publishers interested, signed with one, and then, yeah, released it on May the 12th. Wow. Congratulations, Thank first you. of all. Thank you. And also, you mentioned um, BBC. So, I know you have um, a podcast over there. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. do you want to tell us what that's called and about it? And also, give us, like, some key takeaways that people may get if they listen to your podcast. Yeah, sure. Podcast is called Your Work, Your Money. So, we did two seasons of that. Um during the lockdown period. So lockdown happened and I had done a few things with BBC before. Like I did the one extra tour with them and I did a lot of stuff on Five Live and um, other sort of live radio stuff for BBC. Yeah. And I got approached by one of the business correspondents and said, oh, they're thinking of starting this podcast. So a young-ish audience, um, lockdown has happened, a lot of uncertainty in regard to money, the economy, finance. Do you want to be a part of it? Um, I said, okay, cool. Uh, I think I said, I've, I'd, I'd, I'm not a podcaster, but it, if you want me to do it, then <laughs> by it all try. means, you know what I mean? yeah, I'll give it a try. Yeah. So um, we got all the sort of formalities out of the way. Um, and yeah, we did a pilot that went well, did one season, got commissioned for another season. Uh, we won silver at the British Podcast Awards, well which was an incredible achievement. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, we did two seasons because the, the podcast was namely for the lockdown period yeah. and all the uncertainty around there. So as things started to ease off, we, we wasn't, there was like less uncertainty, right? So the podcast is on BBC now. You can listen to it two seasons. Um, and that was a good experience because again, like I said, I never sort of podcasted before, if that's even a yeah. word, right? Um, but no, that was that was a blessing in itself. And yeah, no, major, major, major props to BBC for that. Yeah. And what would be like one key takeaway, two key takeaways? Um, well, maybe things that you really remember saying that really impacted a lot of people from that podcast. Um, we got we got a lot of questions around investing. Mm. So 
lockdown taught, well, exposed, I think, two things, right? Exposed that, number one, you can't tie your income to one place. Yeah. Because if that sure. goes, then you're kind of in the hole. And number two, I feel like people had ample amount of money that they needed to do something with. Because if you was working from home, you're saving on travel, probably saving on food. Yeah. You weren't allowed to go anywhere. So people were accumulating a lot of cash, mm -hmm. not knowing where to put that cash. Yeah. And a lot of the questions we received was just around like, where do I put my money? Yeah. And what does that look like? And you know, do I invest in this and do I invest in that? Crypto had a real surge in that period as well. So a lot of the questions were around crypto and you know, should I invest in crypto, you know, to the moon? <laughs> what, what coins do I buy? Yeah. Um, and a lot of the advice, well, technically wasn't advice, but a lot of the things that I remember talking about was like, if you are going to invest, then you need to ask yourself some questions before you even touch any of the platforms, which is like, what is your time horizon? Are you short term? Are you long term? Mm -hmm. What is your risk appetite like? Yeah. Um, and what are you actually saving for? Because I think those three questions tailor what you're going to invest in. For instance, if you're thinking long term, your risk appetite is quite high and you haven't got a real end goal you're just saving because you know savings good then you can afford to probably take more risk right so you might want to invest in equities for example right but if you're say more short term and you don't have a high risk appetite and you're saving to buy a car or you're saving for a wedding you can't afford to ride the volatility wave right so you you're probably going to invest in something like a fixed income asset right maybe like a government bond or you're going to invest in things that have less volatility um, and those are the things we try to get people to think about because people just wanted to make money, which is fair, but you can make money, but you can also lose money. And I don't think people were thinking about the latter end of that. Yeah, it goes two ways. Exactly, yeah. Okay, thank you so much for letting us pick your brains today. Like, that was amazing. You gave us a lot of insight and a lot of um, valuable tips um, from your journey and like where you are now and how you started out. Yeah. So, it's a... <laughs> no, thank thank you. you so much. I'm sure people watching are clapping as well. Um, so next, I have a few questions for you, Solomon. Okay, so Solomon, you secured your role before leaving university, a graduate role, if I'm correct. So what advice would you give to students that are still at university trying to secure a role before they leave just like you did? Cool. Um, this is an interesting question because I think advice tailors to your situation. But similar to Reggie, the way I try to think of it is I set a big goal and I reverse engineer. So if I think of how I even got into finance, very, very similar. You know, I said, okay, what do these people with brief briefcases walk in the city do? I asked the question, I found out, and then I did the steps in between. So taking it back, I managed to go to a good university and there was a network there. The easiest thing for me was to ask the question. So I asked, how do you do it? Then I found out about Spring Insight Weeks, summer internships, but then that comes to it with its own challenge with cover letters, CVs, interviews. So essentially what I'm trying to say is, you know, think of the bigger question and find out the individual steps and execute as well as you can. And there's something that I live by now, which is every kind of question you have or problem you have, it might sound crude, but it's a problem of ignorance because someone's been through that journey before. So I wasn't the first person to ever um, pursue investment banking. People have done it before. So I just use my network you know fortunately i was in a football team i was able to ask those guys whether it was the people that went out anyone i could seek that could make my journey a lot more smoother i asked so yeah in a long story short you know ask the right questions did the kind of spring internships and did the summer i didn't get my first summer but obviously i leveraged off the benefit of the experience and managed to secure a full-time offer okay there seems to be a bit of a correlation with the football and the finance here um <laughs> But yeah, no, that's amazing. And um, just to touch on that, you said you didn't get your first one that you applied for. Mm -hmm. Some people would feel demotivated by that or a bit like, what would you say is the best approach to dealing with that and moving on and using it to help you? Sure, you've got to just think of the way the world works, you know. Um, things are not handed to you. You have to kind of go and execute. So I think for me, I was always someone with probably great perseverance. So I wasn't willing to say no. I didn't think like, and I feel like you deserve, you're deserving of whatever you can put your mind to. And I think for me, it was like, okay, I didn't get my first internship or I didn't get my first offer. What can I do next? You know, there are people that have done it in their second, third. You know, I heard some stories, you know, in investment banking. I think I went to a networking event and someone said he was in the military and then he went back into investment banking. So as Reggie would know, people go through all shapes and walks of life. They do, they take different turns and pivots. But as long as like you execute on the final goal and that was kind of my, my mentality and thinking. 
Mm-hmm. And I feel like you mentioned that you have a lot of perseverance. So maybe this kind of feeds into the next question. I know here at CorpFit, you're both a corporate coach and a fitness coach. So mm-hmm. talk a bit about your career, also staying in shape and having like a healthy work-life balance. Sure, sure, sure. That was tough in uh, investment banking. And, you know, then we would know, especially at our time, uh, um, you know, we were at the same investment bank. For me, it goes back to my previous point. I think to myself that, you know, beliefs are something that you acquire and it's up to you to shape, you know, your own journey. So for me, I don't like, people say that it's impossible to be fit and work a serious job. Why? Do you know what I mean? I always say to myself that you can do it. It's almost as cliche, but you can do it as long as you put your mind to it, right? So for me, it's all about, setting a routine to make sure everything's a lot more efficient and easy. So to give you an example, once focus on the work, I always made sure that I produced quality work and made sure that, you know, people are happy and I communicated with people. But then I did certain things like preparing my suit the night before to make sure that my transition into work was easy, preparing my meals. And again, I asked people that I saw in shape, you know, how do you do it? And they told me some people had a meal prep company. Well, you know, someone might say, okay, I don't have enough money. Fine, go and purchase the foods, research what works for you and prepare it the night before. Then, you know, there's something I live by. I always make sure I have multiple gym memberships, a 24 hour gym and one local. So that if I have time, say if I'm working from home, for example, um, I can go to my home gym, but the 24 hour gym. So I always had systems to make it a lot more easier for me. And that's something I live by, you know, you, you know, as the saying, you fail to, plan you plan to fail so something I live by no that's really inspirational I w- for me p- personally I even want to know because I find it hard sometimes when I fall out of routine to get back into it so have you had that kind of situation where you fell out of routine and struggled to get back into it or you just pretty much you keep no, up your habits 100% all the time you know it happened but for me especially given lockdown you've, we've had a lot of time to think right and for me the power of the mind is so so powerful I'm obviously big in my faith but once you kind of convince your mind you can do it, then everything falls into place. So for me, I always try and control my mind. How do I do that? I control what I put in. I still kind of listen to social media or go on social media and listen to entertainment, but I make sure the majority of the stuff is positive and that subconsciously is gonna have an effect on the actions I take. So I always try to persevere and make sure that I put the right stuff in my mind so that when I come to that situation, I don't struggle as much. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so you're basically telling me step one for myself is to get a gym membership because I can't <laughs> exercise without you one. You have to. There's, there's someone, like what I'm trying to say is if you can find someone who has made it work, you know, like there's some, I've met people who have had two kids and still managing to keep fit. There is a way if you're willing to, you know, to look hard enough. So. I think it comes to you of how bad do you want it and then executing on that action. Um, that's how I try to think of it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I have a few um, questions for you, Safiya. So both of you did a degree apprenticeship in for technology, right? Um, so what are the critical aspects of that and like how is it structured just to give people who don't really know about it some information? Yeah, so just to dive into kind of like what a degree apprenticeship is, essentially you're getting a fully paid for degree from whatever whoever's your employer essentially and on the other side of that you're also working full-time and getting on the job experience um to dive into the first kind of like key criteria I'd say would be gaining a knowledge-based qualification or a full degree it can even be a master's degree um and then I'd say fundamental skills and that's what you're gaining from whatever field it is that you're working from okay and Victor yeah so just to piggyback off of what Sophia's just said um, there's also like an employment element of it where they're training you to the industry standard. So whereas university would train you what on what the textbook says, uh, your firm is training you on what they want from you. Okay. So if I'm understanding correctly, as you're learning and doing the degree, you're also working like intertwined, not one after the other. Yeah. So to dive a little bit into kind of like our structure. So mine and Victor's structure are actually quite different. So mine actually has weekly rotations. So I'll go about five to six weeks in the office working full time and then have one week full out uni, back to back lectures can be a bit intense. And then I'll get my assignment and I'm doing that when I'm back at work working full time. And then. Okay, yeah. So mine actually has like a 40, 60 split. So two days a week I'm at university studying and doing my lectures. And then for the rest of the week, I'm full time in the office 
um, working towards, you know, completing projects and stuff. That's crazy. So I'm thinking that after college or sixth form, you went straight into a working environment, but at the same time doing um, education as well. So obviously a lot of people that probably chose to go to university did have the time to, you know, do other things and, you know, move out of home um, to like a different city for some um, and, you know, party a little bit. <laughs> so how different was it for you going straight into that kind of, you know, career kind of 40, 60 split or like rotations? Yeah, um, I mean, personally, I'd say I don't really regret the decision. I feel like obviously missing out on things that you would get from a traditional university route, like Freshers' Week, you know, all the party and all the fun. Um, I did miss out on mine was quite different. But I think the side of things, because I worked, because I worked throughout um, my A-levels, I always liked the idea of kind of having my work be relevant to what I want to do in the future and something that I'm really interested in at the moment. So in my team at the moment, I'm in processing automations and that kind of surrounds robotics, RPA, and also explores other elements like um, natural processing or OCR, which is optic character recognition. And these are kind of things that I wouldn't really know from just kind of taking a traditional university route. And I'm able to kind of make really good links between my modules and what I'm doing in the office and in my in-office projects, which I feel like I've learned so much which I wouldn't have got from a different experience. Yeah, and you, Victor? Yeah, so I'd say I didn't really miss out on the freshers' experience. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was... <laughs> I found um, I found ways around it. Um, I, yeah, I was involved in it as much as I would have been had I gone to university. I'd say the only thing that I felt like I did sacrifice was um, choosing the university that I would like to have gone to. But when I think about it, I'd say having the opportunity to work for such a prestigious firm off the back of Sixth Form, it's something that I would have, it's a firm that I would have joined anyway had I gone to the university I wanted to. So with that aspect, I guess it's a good trade-off. Mm, and just to um, continue from something you just mentioned, um, a lot of people have like the three years or so to kind of develop in university before they have to present themselves in this kind of, you know, proper manner or however you want to say it for a, a corporate role, whereas you guys went straight from Sixth Form um, to apply for these roles so what would you say are the skills or like the the things you showed them that made you secure the role how did you pre and prepare for the interview process and the application process okay so I'd say um, to start off I think there's like a big misconception with the great apprenticeships like a lot of people think you have to go in there knowing how to how to act and mm -hmm. you know knowing everything about the industry well they everyone there understands that you know you literally just came from sixth form so like I have a funny story, like when I first showed up on the first day, I got stuck in the revolving doors <laughs> um, with someone who's like a senior, who's a senior manager at the firm. And she just looked back at me and was like, OK. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think like they kind of expect you to not know what you're doing in a sense. And the whole point of it is to train you up so that you by the time you do graduate, you're at that standard. OK, that makes sense. So do you have anything to add, Safia? Yeah, I think maybe just looking at kind of like the key points that you could advertise when looking for kind of like an apprenticeship or degree apprenticeship role, I would say um, would be teamwork. Teamwork's a big thing. Like they want to know that you're able to communicate and be effective and kind of ask the questions because that is your, your role, essentially. You need to ask the questions throughout your kind of qualification. Um, aside from that, I would say organisation. They want to know that you can kind of handle the pressure of doing your qualification or degree and keep up with your full-time employment. Yeah. And then lastly, I'd say um, having relevant work experience to the field that you want to go into and just showing that you have interest and you can take initiative outside of that. Okay, so um, you both did like a technology degree apprenticeship. So did you know you wanted to do technology or did you just find something that you kind of could start? Was it intentional, basically? Um, I'd say I've always had like an interest in technology uh, coming from like watching like Iron Man movies when I was young. <laughs> uh, but... Um, when I first started sixth form, I wasn't sure whether I was going into the tech field because it was a uh, was a lot to do with like you know whether I was going to do maths at A level and such and so. So uh, I guess I kind of decided as I was going in. So once I realised that yeah I was going to do maths, yeah I was going to do computer science, yeah I was going to do physics, I was like I guess it makes sense to go down the technology route. And so that's when I started applying to or oh, started looking at degree apprenticeships and then from there started playing. For me, I'd say mine was a bit more kind of random almost. Um, so initially I kind of felt 
like the pressure of year 11 coming up and kind of UCAS and not really having an idea about what I was really interested in and what I wanted to do like in the long term. So it was kind of during one of the lockdowns where I kind of thought to myself, like, let me look around and see, you know, what I'm really interested in. Because I never really felt really passionate about a specific field or subject. Um, and that's coming from doing like STEM A-levels. Um, so it was actually my sister who brought it up to me about coding. And at first I was thinking no, but um, I did do a bit of research. Um, I started to do like my own little courses, kind of free, like she codes and stuff like that. And then built my own kind of starter projects. And it was when I was kind of like debugging and stuff, I grew a lot of confidence in like what I can do and understanding what's going on. And I think that was what kind of pushed me to keep going down that field. Yeah, that's understandable and definitely relatable. I have a soft spot for tech because obviously I am also a software engineer too. So yeah, through an apprenticeship as well. So I can really relate to um, that and just kind of trying to start up and build confidence. Thank you, Safia and Victor, for the insight into like the way you got into your tech roles. Um, obviously, we have a range of different ways that um, all of our panelists have, you know, entered into their careers, whether it's in finance or whether it's in tech. So thank you guys for your input. Um, so for those watching, um, if you kind of want to emulate what um, some of the routes that have been taken here, whether it's like a degree apprenticeship or, you know, spring weeks and insight weeks, um, you can obviously get some coaching from us here at CourtFit. So you can go to our website, www.courtfit.com and find various coaches there for whatever your needs may be, finance, tech, law, whatever. Um, so now moving on swiftly, I want to ask you, Solomon, a bit about um, your work life balance and, you know, things you've done to contribute to the community, whether it's in fitness or whether it's in finance. Yeah. So the way it started was at university, I was big on social media. And what I mean by that is I used to use Snapchat to just document everything I was doing. So whether I was going on a night out, studying at library, you know, when you're excited at university, I grew up like in inner city London. So going to the university, I went, it was a big campus uni. And so that was a new experience for me. So I just wanted to document it. And unbeknown to me, I used to get a lot of questions from whether it's the football team or I saw your Snapchat, you did this, you did that. So I didn't know, but I was actually documenting a journey people were interested in. And then fast forward, when I think about, you know, getting into investment banking and breaking into uni, for example, similar to Reggie, it was like, it was a challenge to find a focal point um, to kind of show me that journey. So I took the responsibility to say, okay, I'm going to reduce the work of others and document my journey to provide a platform for others, if that makes sense. And I think once you ask questions, you evolve naturally over time, i.e. it went from Snapchat to recording on Instagram. Then eventually I started a YouTube channel, which has been going on, I think it happened in lockdown. Um, it was a very interesting time and I felt that there was not a lot of insight into investment banking. How'd you get in? So if you Google, I'm sure something like break, like war for Wall Street would come up and that's not really, really realistic. The people in finance would know, you know, it's almost like hidden. There's a lot of secrecy towards it, you know, which is understandable because there's a lot of compliance, but in terms of like, how do you apply and what is it like and how do you balance you know, work and, and fitness, I felt like there wasn't much information there. So yeah, my YouTube channel really looks at a couple of things, but the main premise behind it was that, you know, work, work life and work and fitness are not these two distinct things that, you know, live on their own. Like you can synonymously have a healthy work life balance as long as you make the right choices. So I've done, you know, day in the lives and people have just been interested on how I, you know, set my day up, what I do in order to make the best, healthiest choices. And this led to a couple of opportunities and I enjoy it. You, if you do something continually and evolve, you enjoy it, it's going to, you know, push you to do more and more. So, yeah, um, the YouTube channel is Life of Soul. I try, well, no, I do, I, I upload every week um, and that just comes from me being prepared making a lot of content and making sure I can push that out. And also creating systems, one more thing, because a lot of people tell me, how do you edit? How do you create content? So I used to, I still do. I bought a Mac and I learned, which is very, very important. But then I thought to myself, what is the bigger value activity? Is it spending eight to nine hours editing or producing content? When I answered that question, I thought I should outsource. What I mean by that is, you know, I value my time at say 50 pounds. If I can find 
um, someone to create the content or edit for me less than that, then it, it's worth the decision if that makes sense. And so that's how I'm able to like produce more content. But it's still important for you to like learn how to do it because you can oversee the process and know what's good and bad. But yeah, that's what I try to do um, with Life as well. Mm, I really relate to that. Um, I think it's important to give back and YouTube is a go-to place for people to find information like that um, and obviously kind of, you know, see into your life without, without having to call you up, you know, get more of your time. You're actually appealing to the masses. Um, it's more efficient and effective that way. Um, I also have a YouTube channel, Intricate the Tech Babe. So it's the same kind of thing, having Let's Talk Tech, the series, like episodes one to five, and just kind of giving people insight. So I really do respect that and relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, with the editing thing, like I I hear that editing is quite a long process. I think I try to monetize by like um, editing other people's YouTube videos. So I'll be the person you went to to say, can you edit? So You're not going to like me. I'm like on it. It comes yeah. from the investment banking. Like I used to work with an associate who like attention to detail, something, you know, mm. but this associate was so, she was focused. Let's use that word on attention to detail. So subconsciously I picked that up. So any little things, you know, misalignment or subtitle, that comes into it because you, you you learn the good thing about finance it teaches you to produce at a very good standard like excellence is yeah. expected you're not necessarily rewarded mm -hmm. um and so yeah it translates into youtube so yeah yeah i can imagine it's it's good because um at least you can as a, a client um say you know can you move the subtype subtitle to this you know the terminology you know what it takes so it's a lot easier for the editor to do it than just being like can you put a pink thing on the screen somewhere here like it makes sense okay so thank you so much for sharing that with us and for all your contributions to the corporate community and the wider community community as well for fitness and for tech i'm sorry for fitness and for finance so i have a final question for everybody on, on the panel so just quickly give your I would just say your top tip, number one, if someone said you have 30 seconds to give me the most value you can from what you've learned in your experience, what would you say? So we'll start with Reggie and work our way through the, the panel. I think my biggest tip stems from life and the journey that I've, I've sort of been on. And one thing that I always try to remember is the hardest moments create the best stories. And I say that because there was there's like been lots of times when you're on this journey and you just want to give up or things aren't going your way or you think this is long or this isn't what I want to do. And you almost try to find various different excuses just so that you don't have to continue on that journey. Mm -hmm. And I've been through it. I'm pretty sure the people on the panel have been through it as well. But I feel like those hard moments are what makes the end result so beautiful and makes the end result so worthy. Mm -hmm. And like I always say, I wouldn't be sitting on this sofa or various other sofas if I didn't persevere through those hard moments so yeah I'll say the hardest moments create the best journey yeah I think it's kind of what people say sometimes flippantly but it's really when they say pressure makes diamonds it's mm. those hard moments that bring out you know the the real value and like the the beautiful moments that you have mm. today okay and Safia what about you what would you say um I think I'd say to be confident and be confident when you're building connections and build connections but also be selective when you're doing that I think it's very important to remember that not everyone should be kind of exposed to your energy and like what you're like. And I think I get a lot of questions about kind of how to get to companies and what to do to get there. But I think it's important to kind of remember that as much as you're interviewing for the company, they're interviewing for you. Yeah. Like they need to meet your standards, they need to align with your values. That's a good point. I like what you said there. I think, you know, confidence, a lot of people um, face this imposter syndrome and sometimes um, it's hard to get over. And I think people talk about it a lot, but ultimately it's about confidence and you know believing in yourself and I think what you said about making sure the company is the right fit for you helps you to overcome that as well um not feeling like an outsider or like you don't quite fit and um, what about you Victor what would you suggest um, I'd say be intentional uh, so when making decisions you know think about why you're doing it don't just do things for the sake of doing them so if you do want to go to university you know pick a degree that you know will think you think will apply to you and even just as simple as like you know when you wake up in the morning like you know your appearance for example like plays <laughs> it plays a part be <laughs> presentable <laughs> yeah so like it plays a part in your confidence like when i go into work i iron my shirts the night before i lay it all out so when i go in i feel a bit more confident it's like i'm not rushing in the middle of the day like at the beginning of the day sorry and so i go out and i'm feeling a bit more confident 
Mm-hmm. And so when I talk to people, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like what you said about being intentional. I think it kind of relates to what um, Solomon said before. It's like, if you don't know why he was doing his YouTube channel or why he wanted to go to the gym, then it's easy to fall off and it's easy to like lose passion or get to that that dull moment where you're like, what am I doing with my life? So when you when you make decisions intentionally and you know do things you actually are passionate about or being in a place where you think is the right fit for you, is um, it's just an easier setup for success, I, I believe. What about you, Solomon? What would you advise? You know, my mind's evolved, but I think the biggest thing I'd probably say is don't be afraid to fail um, because you shouldn't see it as taking a risk. You should see it as like, you know, not risking or betting on yourself, if that makes sense. Um, when you kind of are afraid to fail, you it prevents you from taking the action that will get you closer to your goals. You so, you know, if we go back to the way schools taught, sometimes we're taught to be correct, to make few mistakes, but the more mistakes, you should view it as I'm getting closer to my goal. I'm finding out the best route. And to make that journey easier, there's two things. Always try to seek the right people. And I think it's been prevalent in everyone's life because they've been through the journey and they can make it easier for you. And always, you know, if you stop learning, you stop earning. So always try to apply knowledge and wisdom wherever you can take it, whether it's through social media, through the right people, through reading books. Because, you know, reading books, for example, is, you know, leveraging on someone's experience who's already gone it and you can just take the best bits, right? So I'd always say, um, yeah, I'd probably say don't be afraid to fail. Yeah, I agree with that heavily. I think, how would you know if you don't try? Um, You've only failed if you don't try that's the only way you can for sure fail so yeah definitely I believe that is a good one and also it's kind of I know this is a weird example but like playing a game it's like level one to level 10 you probably fail at level two and you have to start again maybe but then it's easier to get to level four and so on and you eventually reach the goal um without the experience or failure it's harder to work through it next time so I definitely agree with that so um, I just want to say a big, massive thank you to everyone that's here today for giving us your time, your wisdom, and you know, letting us, you know, ask you a hundred questions. But yeah, you guys have been very patient with me, and you've given a lot of useful insight to our community here at CorpFit. Um, so if I can just go through one by one with you, just give us your name and your socials where we can find you, etc. So starting with you, Reggie. Um, Reggie Nelson underscore ten is my handle for everything, and LinkedIn is Reggie Nelson. My name. Okay, cool. And Sophia? So, Sophia. And you can find me on TikTok, Sophia Rosie. And just in general, Sophia Rosie. Okay, thank you. And Victor? Um, Victor, I think that's, um, don't know if it's going to spell that for them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Victor, I think that's, um, uh, that's my LinkedIn and my Instagram is photos of VA. Okay, thank you. And Solomon? So, Solomon Soul, you can find me on YouTube at, um, at Life of Soul. My Instagram handle is underscore Life of Soul. I think my TikTok is Life of Soul One. And yeah, that's how you can find me. Okay, thank you. So, um, thank you for being with us here today for our podcast episode on um, getting into finance and into technology. Um, you can find us on, on www.courtfit.com. You can find us on TikTok at Train with Courtfit and on Instagram at Courtfit Official. And on our website, you can find a free school leavers guide, which touches on different ways you can get into different corporate careers. Um, so, yeah, thank you guys again, and we'll see you next time. Bye. It's been your host, Esther, corporate coach here at Courtfit. <laughs>